In my Dino vs Node.js video, I had a ton of people ask for a crash course on Dino, so in this video, I'm going to teach you everything you need to know to get started with Dino. Today's video is brought to you by me and all of my courses over at courses.webdevsimplified.com. And the reason for that is because these videos are really difficult to produce. They take quite a lot of time because I not only need to learn the new technology Dino, but I also need to understand it well enough that I can break it down and teach it to you. So if you're interested in supporting the channel and all of the free videos that I make, go over to my course page, courses.webdevsimplified.com, pick up one of my courses, and I guarantee you're going to love it. So let's get started with the Dino video. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name's Kyle, and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream project sooner. So if that sounds interesting, make sure you subscribe to the channel for more videos just like this. Now to get started with Dino, the very first thing you need to do is install Dino onto your computer. And if you just go to dino.land, they're going to have the installation instructions for your operating system. So for example, if you're on Windows like me, you just need to copy this command here, paste it into PowerShell, run it, it'll take maybe a minute or so to download everything, and then you can immediately get started with using Dino. One thing to note though is you're probably going to have to close out of your terminal and reopen it for it to recognize Dino since it was just installed. So if you run into an error saying it's not recognized when you try to run Dino commands, most likely you just need to close the terminal and reopen it. Once you have that done, you can actually move into writing Dino programs and actually running them. So let's jump out of here and go into Visual Studio Code, and let's just create a file. We're just going to call it sample.js, and this is going to be where we run our very first Dino project. And to write Dino code, you can write it in either JavaScript or TypeScript because Dino supports TypeScript out of the box. But since I focus mostly on JavaScript on my channel, we're going to be doing strictly JavaScript. But if you wanted, you could do TypeScript instead. So to write a Dino program, it's very similar to writing any JavaScript program. For example, we could just say console.log hello world. And now we have this program. But in order to run it, all we need to do is open up our console here we can type in deno run and then the name of our file. So sample, whoops, sample.js. And there you go, you can see it printed out hello world and ran our deno program. So that's pretty straightforward and easy to understand. It's very similar to if we were to run this with Node. The nice thing about Dino though, is it actually has some really nice tooling built around it for doing common things that you're gonna need to do. For example, let's say we take this console log and we kind of mess up our formatting. We have something like this maybe. With just a bunch of random spaces where we don't actually want them. Well, we can actually fix the formatting by just running deno fmt, which stands for format. And when we run that, it's going to format our file using the built-in deno formatting configuration, which is really nice because you don't have to worry about figuring out how to configure everything and format everything on your own. It's just built into Dino and it'll just do it for you. And I find that really, really handy. It's kind of like having Prettier built into your own workflow, except for it's much, much faster than Prettier, which is a huge bonus for larger projects where you need to format a bunch of files all the time. Another huge bonus for Dino is that it has a lot of tooling built in for supporting browser APIs. You may know if you've used Node before that you cannot use Fetch in Node, even though it's built into the browser and it's a standard in the browsers. Well, with Dino, their goal is to make all of the browser standards compatible with Dino. So you can actually use fetch right inside of Dino. So let's just do that inside of this sample file here. We can just say fetch, and then we can pass it in a URL. So I'm just gonna copy over a URL here, which is for the JSON placeholder API. Just like this, you can use whatever URL you want. Then we can come in here and just say dot then, we're gonna get a response. And we're gonna convert that response here to JSON. And then we're going to do another dot then, and this time we're going to just actually log this out. So we're going to have our data, which we're going to log out, which is console.log console of data. And we can also just make sure that we await this here because it's an asynchronous call fetches. And we can come down here and run this. And you're going to see immediately that we get an error. And this is something else that Dino does, which is absolutely amazing. And that is it has really strong permissions. So as you can see here, it says uncaught permission denied network, ac network access to our URL. And it says run again with the allow network flag. So we can copy this allow net flag and we've passed that into our run function here. So whenever we run the run command, we need to tell it what our permissions are. 
what do we allow this program to do? Because by default, this program can't access any files, can't access the internet, and we need to tell it, okay, we're allowing you to access the internet. So now if we run it, you can see it successfully queried that API and printed out the first user, with, or the first to-do, sorry, from that JSON placeholder API. Now that's really nice, but you don't always want to allow your program to access every single website on the internet. What if someone came in here and changed this to, for example, you know, evil.com, and you don't want them to access evil.com, that would be malicious code that got injected into your program. So what you can do instead is take this allow net, and you can actually pass it here a particular URL. So we can pass it JSON placeholder type code.com like that. And if we run, you can see everything runs just fine. But if this gets changed, for example, to evil.com somewhere, maybe you install a package and it tries to fetch from evil.com, if we run it, we're gonna get that error that's saying permission is denied. We don't have access to query and fetch from this evil.com URL. So that's a really nice way that just built in permissions inside of Dino. So you don't have to worry about downloading a package and having that package be some malicious package that is mining Bitcoin or doing something else crazy. Another thing that you may have noticed is I used await without actually putting it inside of an async function. This is something Dino has built in and it allows you to do what's called top level await, which essentially means you can do an await that's not inside of a function. And that's just really handy because otherwise you'd have to wrap this in a function and call that function. And that's a real pain to do. So it's nice just having that built in like we want it. Also, because Dino is newer than Node, a lot of the APIs are built around promises. So you don't have to worry about using callbacks and stuff like that, like you do with Node. So all of the Dino APIs are going to be built around promises and async await, which is just much nicer to deal with. Also, something that you're probably going to think is really weird is we can actually access the window object inside of our Dino program. And this is something you would only really think about inside of a JavaScript environment on a browser, but we actually have access to this window and we can, for example, add an event listener. So we can say add event listener, and we want to add an event listener here for, whoops, don't want caps locks, load, for example. And all we need to do inside of here is just, just console.log out that we have loaded. Let's just do the exact same thing for unload. We can come in here, we can say unload and unloaded. Now, if we run that program again, just make sure we change this to our JSON code right here instead of evil.com. There we go. Let's run that, and you can see we get our loaded being printed out, then our fetch completes, and then unloaded gets printed out. So we can actually run, essentially, events that happen whenever our program loads and whenever our program unloads, and that's really handy and something that is pretty much impossible to do in Node, but now we can do that really easily inside of Dino with these window add event listeners for load and unload. And anything else that you can think of in the browser, for example, if you wanted to do a set timeout, all of that is built into Dino, so you can do all of that out of the box, which is amazing. Now, something else that is a lot different in Dino compared to Node is how they handle packages and package management. In Node, you obviously use NPM and this massive Node modules folder for all of your different packages, but Dino is different because they use URLs for managing packages, and there is no package.json or Node modules folder to worry about. So let's take an example of that. Let's just delete all of our code that we have here. Start with a fresh slate. And let's take, for example, that we want to convert something that we pass into our program into a QR code that we can actually view and scan later. So there's a package that we can use called a QR code. So we can use the import statement to import that. We're gonna say QR code here. And you notice that I'm not installing any package. I'm not npm i QR code or anything like that. Dino just handles all of that installation for you, which is really handy. So we can say import that QR code from, and here, instead of passing, you know, QR code like you're used to or express like you're used to with Node, what you're gonna do is actually pass a URL to the file that you want. So we're gonna come in here, HTTPS, and we wanna go to dino.land slash X slash QR code slash mod dot TS. This is QR code. And what this does essentially is we have our top level domain here, our dino land slash X, this is essentially a fancy thing that Dino has, which just redirects us to a GitHub page. So this is just pulling directly from GitHub in the master branch right now. We're not versioning anything yet. We're just doing the master branch. And this DinoLand.x part of the beginning is essentially redirecting us to that GitHub page for our QR code library that we want. And it has that mod.ts file, 
which is the main file that contains this QR code here. So now that we have this library installed, let's actually use this to create a QR code. It's pretty simple to do actually. We're going to convert some kind of text to a base64 encoded image of our QR code. So we'll just say here, image source, and that's gonna be equal to us running that QR code function, and we wanna pass it in whatever argument we pass to our function. So for example, we could say deno run sample.js, and we pass something in here like test, and that'll convert test into a QR code. And in order to get the arguments in Dino, all we need to do is say dino.args, and that's going to give us an array of our arguments, and we just wanna get our first argument, so we'll say dino.args of zero. This is going to be essentially a base64 encoded version of our image, and now we can actually take that and let's just log it out for now. So we'll say here, image source, and now if I actually run this, as you can see, we got a promise, so we just need to make sure I await this and rerun that. And now as you can see, we get this long string of text, which is essentially a base64 encoded version of our image, which we can use to display a QR code. So let's take that even a step further and write an HTML file that has this image in it. So that's actually pretty simple to do. We can use the built-in Dino library by just saying Dino here dot, and we're gonna call the function write text file. And all we do is pass it the path to our file. So we'll say QR code dot HTML, and we pass it what we want to write inside that file. So for us, we want to have an image tag, and this image tag is gonna have a source, which is going to be equal to that image source, whoops, image source like that. And we just need to make sure that we close this off just like that. And now if I get rid of this console log, we don't need it anymore because we're gonna be creating a file called QR code HTML that has this image in it. Now, if I run this, we're going to get an error. And that's because again, Dino has these built in permissions. We don't have the write flag. We cannot write files. So when we run this, we need to run it with the, whoops, allow write flag. And that essentially says, I'm allowing you to write files. So now if we run this, of course I spelled something wrong most likely. Yep, I need to put this allow write after run and before our file name. So we say allow write. Now if I run it, you're gonna notice we have a new file, qrcode.html. It has the image with our source in it. And if we just come in here and open this file with live server, Give it a second, it's gonna load, and you can see that we have a QR code that was generated for that exact text that we passed into that QR scanner method. Now, before I start talking more about dependencies and how to handle dependencies inside of Dino, I wanna talk a little bit about more built-in tooling in Dino, and we're gonna talk about the test-based tooling built into Dino. And that's right, they have testing built into Dino. So let's just quickly delete all of this code and create a function called sum. The sum function is just gonna take a and b, and it's gonna return a plus b. And let's just make sure that we export this function as a default so that way we can use this inside of our testing. So now we have a simple sum function which returns a plus b. And if we want to test that, we can just create a file called sample.test.js. And inside of here, we can actually test our sample.js using Dino because they have a built-in dino.test which we can just put a string saying testing sum, and then a function, whoops. And this function is going to be where we actually test that sum code that we wrote inside of sample.js. So let's import that. We'll say import sum from dot slash sample.js. So now we can actually use sum inside of here. So we can say, for example, sum of one and two, and we wanna expect that this is equal to three. So a way to do that in Dino is by using the standard library that Dino has built in. They have a bunch of functions for doing many different things from dates, times, colors, all the way to testing different assertions. So we can import assert equals, which is the assertion function for equals. So if we wanna assert that sum of one, two equals three, we'll use assert equals. We're gonna get that from the Dino standard library. So just like everything in Dino, we need to make sure we do this from the web. We're importing something from the web. So we can say HTTPS, you know, backslash, backslash, dino.land, we go slash STD. This is going to be for the standard library, slash testing for the testing portion. And we wanna do asserts.ts. Now we can use that asserts equal. So assert equals sum of one, two, and three. 
This is going to essentially assert that these two numbers are equal. And if we run that, we can just say deno test. It's going to run all of our test files. You can see that it's first compiling the project, and then it's running our test, and it says one of our tests passed, which is exactly what we want. If we change this to four, for example, and run this, we're going to get that our test failed. So now we know at least that our testing framework is working, and it's all built into Dino, which is really, really handy. Something you'll notice, though, is that I'm installing whatever the latest version of the standard library is. This is generally a bad practice because if the standard library updates, it could break my code by changing how assert equals works or maybe just getting rid of this function completely. So in order to install a specific version, you can do that inside of the URL. For the standard library here, you just put an at symbol and then we want to put our version. And right now the most up-to-date version is 0.51.0. So now if we save that, and we rerun our program, you can see that it's running just fine. And now we're restricting ourselves to this 0.51.0 version of the standard library, which is nice since we don't have to worry about this updating and breaking all of our code. Now you're probably looking at this just like I did when I first learned about this URL importing and thinking, well, what if I want to update to 0.52, for example? And I have this imported all over my project. Well, then I'd have to change that import in every single one of my files. And that sounds terrible. So instead of doing that, the best practice in Dino is to create what's called a dependencies file. So we'll just say depths.js. And inside of here, we import and export all of our dependencies. So let's just copy this assert equals out of here and put it in here. And what we do is essentially just export this. We would just say export the assert equals from here. And that's essentially saying now, anytime we want to use assert equals, instead of importing it from Danoland.standard library and all that, all we would do is say import assert equals, and we want to import it from our dot slash depths.js. Now, if I go and I run this, you're going to see everything is working just as before. But the nice thing is, now when we want to update the version of our standard library to 0.52 here, we can do it in one single location, and it's going to update everywhere because we're just importing from this one file. So this almost acts as your package JSON file, which determines where all of your dependencies are. So that's really handy. But something else that a lot of people are worried about with this URL parsing format is that what happens if someone just updates the file at the standard library location or at any other location that you're using? Because it's just a URL. You can change the files whenever you want, but you don't actually have to change the version. For example, they could upload a different file to this URL with this version, and now all of the code is going to be getting that different file. So in order to get around that problem, Dino has an idea of lock files, which are going to test the integrity essentially of the new file with the current file that you're using to make sure that the file that you currently built your program with is not different than the new file that it's downloading and installing. So if someone does go behind your back and change the file at this location, it's not actually going to break your code. So let me show you an example of how to do that. So in order to demo how this works, let's just create a file called library.js. And inside of library.js, we can just imagine we're exporting some function. This is a library that we're downloading from the internet. So we could say export default function, and we're just gonna call it print. And it's just gonna say console.log i. And now inside of sample.js, instead of having this sum information in here, let's just import that file. So we can say import print, we want to import it from our whoops, dot slash library dot js. And we can just call that print function. And now if we run this, so we could say dino run sample dot js, you can see it prints out high. Now it's not going to work with this local import because we don't actually lock our local imports. But what we can do is kind of trick our computer into thinking this is an external import by just coming down in the corner here and running go live. This is an extension called live server. It's going to essentially serve this entire directory inside of a URL. So you can see this URL here. We're just going to copy this URL. And now what we can do is use that URL instead of our local import. And now what's going to happen is Dino is going to think that this library is an external library and it's going to try to install it. So now when we run Dino, you can see it's downloading that library and it's still printing out high. So everything is working like we expect. So now that we have essentially a remote file, a remote library that we're downloading and installing, let's look at how we can actually cache and lock this file. To do this, we can run a command called Dino cache. And inside of here, we put dash dash lock. 
and we give it the name of some lock file. We're just going to say lock.json. It's pretty standard naming. And in order to first create this lock file, we need to say lock write and then pass it in the file that we want to lock our dependencies for. Generally, this would be our dependencies file here if you're using a dependencies file. But in our case, we just have one file. So we're just going to pass in sample.js. And what this is going to do is create a lock.json file, which takes our URL here and essentially creates a hash of what that file looks like. So that way, if this file ever gets changed and it gets re-downloaded, this check is going to run and say, hey, this file has changed, something is broken. So let me show you how you can actually load up the cache. So if you're going to a brand new computer or maybe you're deploying to production and you want to download all of the files, you could just run dino cache and inside of here, we need to pass our lock file again. So we could say lock is equal to lock.json and we need to tell it our file, which in our case is sample.js. So it's going to try to re-download all of the different dependencies inside of sample.js and compare them to our lock file. So this should successfully run. And as you can see, no errors were thrown, everything worked as we expected. And to make sure that we force Dino to re-download everything, let's make sure we pass in here dash dash reload. This is gonna force Dino to re-download everything even if it's already downloaded on your computer. So now as you can see, we got that download script and it says it downloaded that file. So let me show you what happens if this library changes without the URL actually updating. Essentially, they re-uploaded the file under the same version. We could say inside of here something like evil. Maybe it's changed to be some evil file. So now when we try to reload our cache, you're going to see it's downloading that file. And then it's saying that a resource has failed its integrity check. It's saying that our library.js is now different than when the last time we installed it from the exact same URL. So this is a giant red flag saying something bad is probably happening. So do not download this. And it essentially is failing that download and not letting us continue and giving us this nice warning. This is essentially the way that Dino is trying to handle security in a better way than NPM has done in the past, and also a way that you can create essentially the equivalent of a package.json lock file without having to deal with the whole package.json thing. And that's pretty much all you need to know about Dino to get started. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to check out my other videos, which are going to be linked over here, and subscribe to the channel for more videos just like this. Thank you very much for watching, and have a good day.